name is Tiara Feuchtner, and she is a postdoc at the Department of Computer Science. Her main interest as a computer scientist lies in the human-computer interaction. And uh, she explores mixed reality approaches for remote assistance in collaboration with the LEGO group and uh, also with the win systems. So let's give a warm welcome to talk about the role of our bodies during interaction in virtual environments to Tiara. Thanks a lot. Um, is this working? You really can't hear down here. It's amazing. Okay, um, so I'll be talking about the, the role of our bodies, in particular of our virtual bodies during uh, interaction in virtual environments, and uh, how such virtual bodies could actually be transformed, how they could be changed to allow new ways of interaction. Uh, for example, a virtual arm could be extended to allow you to reach out to, to uh, objects in the environment that are out of your reach and allow you to maybe control them, interact with them. So for me, uh, VR is still very much alive because for me it's a very uh, valuable tool for research. Uh, VR allows me a, a very controlled experimental environment where I can, I can control exactly what people see, what they hear, what they're allowed to do, and I can track very well what the participants are doing. I can track their movements, I can check where they're looking, um, and I can uh, also make them experience the space around them in a very realistic manner, which means I can control how they behave because if I put you in a different room, you might behave differently. So for me, uh, VR and the especially immersive uh, environments are a very valuable tool. And currently, the way to interact with VR is most often with the use of controllers, like these uh, HTC Vive controllers that you see as virtual controllers in the virtual world as well, and you press buttons and pull triggers to interact with these objects around you. Now this is uh, actually really awesome way to interact, especially in, in situations where you're already holding some kind of tool, like a gun, for instance, that has a similar shape as these controllers. So this is the Space Pi Pirate Trainer. If you haven't tried it, I highly recommend it. Uh, you hold this gun in your hand that has the shape of the controller, and you pull the trigger to shoot. It's a whole lot of fun. And um, despite games like this, I think there are other cases where controllers aren't suited as well. Uh, for example, if you look at this uh, pressing a button in VR using a controller, I don't know if you can see, but what you have to do here is you actually have to pull the trigger to press the button. So you put the controller on the button and then you pull the trigger. To me, that's counterintuitive, and I would really prefer something like that, which is more what we do in real life. And um, generally, I think our hands are the most powerful and versatile tools that we already have without having to pick up something new. And there's already hand tracking technology out there that allows us to do this. And this can actually enable more natural and, and versatile and, and creative interactions, more expressive as well. So with hand tracking, virtual objects are literally at our fingertips. We can play around with them like in the real world. But still, what you see here is only hands. And I'm wondering, can we go a little bit further? Because in the real world, we don't just see our hands. Our hands are connected to our arms. Our arms are connected to our bodies. We know we're there. We perceive our body in our peripheral vision. We perceive our shadows. So there's always a bit more to us than in VR. And I think that this, this disembodied state is unnatural and will always remind you that what's around you in VR isn't quite real and that the virtual world can't affect you. And I think for the virtual world to affect you, what we need is body ownership. Now, body ownership, that's a concept from psychology, and what it basically means that if you consider your left hand, you know it's your hand. It's not someone else's. Uh, you can feel things with it. You can manipulate things with it. It's part of your body, and you, f you feel body ownership normally for your entire physical body, but under certain circumstances, you can actually perceive body ownership of body external objects, and that's then called a body ownership illusion. And a very famous, uh, or probably the, the most well-known uh, body ownership illusion is the rubber hand illusion. Some of you are already nodding, so you know it. Um, in this experiment, a rubber hand is placed on the table in front of a participant next to their real hand. But the real hand is hidden from you. And then the experimenter starts stroking both the rubber hand and the real hand at the same time in exactly the same manner. And what you see and what you feel coincides. So you feel strokes and you see them on the rubber hand and if this hand is threatened, you will react 
in a similar way as if your own hand had been threatened in that moment. And that's because you are under the illusion that this rubber hand is somehow connected to you, that you can perceive with it. Um, and uh, illusions like this are also achievable in VR, maybe even more easily achievable. Uh, for example, this person here can see the virtual hand move like her own hand. And when she sees this ball hit her finger, she feels a slight vibration. There's a vibration motor taped to her index finger, and she feels that. So we have multi-sensory stimulation. Whatever happens in VR becomes so much more real because you can actually feel it and see it, and it responds to your movements. Um, so taking advantage of this illusion has enabled, enabled a lot of interesting research. Um, and researchers have found that our bodies define the way how we feel and how we react. It's like if you imagine wearing different clothes that will change your attitude. What they found here is that if you embody a, a body of a dark-skinned body wearing casual clothes, this will influence how you play the drums. So you might actually play drums more vigorously because you think you're a black person or you imagine that. Um, and they compared that if you embody a white person formally clothed, then you would be a bit more timid and you know a bit more rigid. Um, another example is uh, that uh, embodying a body of different gender will actually increase empathy. In this study, they uh, let men uh, embody a, a woman, so they had a woman's body, and then there was this virtual man verbally attacking them, telling them how ugly they looked. And they looked into this mirror and they saw this woman's body and, and they felt more empathetic, they felt more understanding of her, her mimics, they could suddenly imagine um, how she could actually feel in this moment. Uh, this is, I think, currently being used for um, uh, domestic violence treatments uh, in, in Spain. Um, a very different area, I guess, for application of this uh, is when interacting with abstract cursors versus a virtual hand. This might actually change how you move, how you behave. So if you just watch him reaching around the saw blade, making sure that the virtual hand doesn't touch it, and compare that to how he moves the hand when it's an abstract hand. He just goes from right to left because there's nothing there. The saw can't hurt him, right? So if we just consider how if we gave us if we gave ourselves bodies in VR, how that might actually change how we behave and what we do. So based on this research, and since I have a background in human-computer interaction, I wanted to explore new interaction techniques. By virtually extending the human body to overcome some of its physical limitations, kind of giving us superpowers, um, and make this virtual extension feel like it's part of the own body. And that was a really important point for me. Um, and uh, today I'll present two of my projects, really briefly, in which I aimed to achieve this. The first one um, I would like to show you is this prototype of an augmented reality system where you can extend your arm. You already saw the video in the beginning very briefly. Uh, you can extend your arm to reach to something that's uh, out of reach, and you can interact with it. So he sees this long arm extending, and then he can reach this tilting surface and simply press it up or down. Um, and so wearing this, this is an Oculus Rift DK2. This was uh, also before Elite Motion, that's why I didn't add hand tracking. But So I turned it into a video see-through HMD, so through the, the camera that's on the front, you can actually see your, your real environment um, in the headset. And then I tracked the, okay, so the, the furniture that you see there, the desk, the curtain, and that tilting surface, those were all actuated. So through an Arduino, I could control the electric motors that made them move uh, or open or close. And um, I used optical tracking. All these glowing dots you see are markers for the optical tracking system. So I also tracked the user, the user's hand movements. And based on the distance of the user's hand to his shoulder, I extended the arm. So if the user's hand was close to his body, the virtual hand would move with his own hand. But as soon as he reached a bit further than a certain threshold, the, the virtual hand would actually extend, and it would, it would go out up to, I think, four meters length is the limit I set. And that would look a bit rubbery, like that. And with this arm, they could reach out to this desk and push it up or down. And it was really important to me here to make this interaction as uncomplicated, as direct as possible, so I, I tried to avoid using any buttons or any memorized gestures, so just allowing them to actually press on the surface they wanted to manipulate. They could also open and close this curtain by simply pushing this handle open and close. So I kind of had to invent a metaphor for a handle here. Um, 
But the point in this was that even though this virtual arm behaved very differently to how our own arms actually behave, they could control it, and they felt as if this arm was connected to them. It wasn't as realistic as their own arm, obviously, but it still felt like it was theirs. It was theirs to control, it was theirs to interact with. And uh, in an evaluation of the system, I found that the participants were actually able to use this long arm without prior training. So they were able to simply put the headset on and start interacting and moving the furniture around as they wished. And of course, the furniture is just a placeholder for whatever we might want to control. You could imagine if you have a disability, you maybe can't leave your bed or just can't access some things that normal people could, some setup like this could allow you to interact with the world through your body or through your new virtual body. And in the second prototype that I want to show you, I aimed at actually reducing the strain of overhead interaction. So this is a little bit different. Um, so the blue thing you see is a, an overhead target, and the yellow outline you see is a virtual arm. So that's where the person is currently interacting or is supposed to interact. And I wanted to allow them to do that while holding their arm at waist level in a very comfortable posture. And um, this, of course, results in a very large offset between your real and your virtual arm. But my goal was to still keep this feeling of body ownership for this virtual arm, despite them looking up at a virtual hand and having their own hand here. I wanted to keep this connection. Um, the setup I used here was an HTC Vive. This is a bit more recent. And I placed two uh, leap motion uh, sensors on the front, which are hand tracking sensors. And I needed two of these because I wanted to let them interact with the target at the top first and then slowly transition their hand downwards. So one tracker would track your hands in line of sight and the second one would do that. Same thing in front of their bodies. Um, so I'll just show you what this actually looked like. Um, you'll see on the left side this woman interacting with the target. She's looking upward. That's where the target currently is. On the right, you see what she is seeing. And just watch and try to pay attention to where her right hand is. And you see that it's moving downward. This is fast forward, so this is all happening fairly slowly. She's still looking up, but her right hand is actually at waist level now. She's still interacting with the target overhead. We'll just watch it again, it's, it's looping. Um, so the thing is that this transition happens so slowly that she barely noticed it happening. She kind of, when she was around halfway, she noticed, oh, there, there's something a bit wrong here. But it wasn't jarring, it wasn't disrupting. And most importantly for me, it actually didn't break this illusion of this virtual arm being her own. It didn't break the expectation of her thinking that she might actually be able to feel things with this hand. If I gave her the virtual ball, she would feel that on her finger. So um, while this prototype aims to ease overhead interaction, a similar approach could, for instance, be used for uh, stroke rehabilitation, where you kind of forget and have to learn again how to use your arm if you see movements that can help uh, reconfigure the connections in your brain to learn this again. Or an inverse approach could be actually used to uh, help with physiotherapy, which has also been done, or is being done in Barcelona at the moment. So just to summarize, um, my research shows that for direct manipulations of objects that are difficult to reach, we can modify the virtual body we interact through, or at least the body that we think we have at that moment while still perceiving it as our own body. And this is possible because what our bodies are in our minds, that's very malleable. We can change that, we can shape that. And um, I mean, one vision that I have is that if, if we augment our environment with actuators, robots maybe, we could lift up cars with our fingertips because the robot could be doing it, but what you perceive, what you're doing, the actions you're doing is that of just closing your fingers on that car and lifting it, right? So I think that there could be a discrepancy between what is happening in the world and what you're perceiving, but to me, what you're perceiving is the important thing. Um, and I, I want to add that I'm not saying don't use controllers, not at all. Use controllers wherever it makes sense. I'm just saying consider whether it makes sense to use controllers. Even when you use controllers, consider whether there might be a body anyways. Um, because that actually might change how we interact with the world. And most importantly, if we have virtual bodies, we can transform them and we can be, give people superpowers to interact with the world. That's all for me. Yep. Thanks. Just one question. 
is your computer, Mark, is it all set up, ready to go? Um, yeah. Good. Should be. So I just want to ask you, Tiara, um, all the potential and the superpowers that we can get, what kind of uh, potential do you see, you know, what, who could benefit from changing gender or becoming an animal or some kind of a superhero or, you know, what, what kind of psychological benefits could there be of this? That's a really good question. I mean, so there, there's one benefit for research itself because we can actually learn how people perceive um, how people perceive their identity or, or other people, how they could uh, identify with an outgroup, perhaps, like someone of a different gender or, of a, or a different skin color. Um, so I'm not sure I'd focus so much on, on what a single person could profit from, from that, but more what the society could in general because we could actually let people experience things they wouldn't ever be able to experience in real life. Would we be able to measure an increase in empathy, for example? For example, there, uh, there's this one study, I didn't show it, but the, the changing skin color uh, is a study they did in Barcelona, and what they measured there was a reduction of uh, implicit racial, racial bias after experiencing having a, a black body for, I think, 45 minutes. So there are ways of evaluating that, and the results show that it does have an effect on, on how we perceive the people around us and ourselves. And I, I am also thinking of the potential for people who feel like they're born in the wrong body, gender-wise, and they could actually go in there and be themselves to feel that, have that experience. Yeah, also. that so might there's a lot of potential. Yeah, I think so, there's a lot so of potential. So if I, I also ask you uh, for a view towards the future, what do you think are we going to have bodies in virtual reality? And can these bodies represent us? Will we have physical avatars that we can walk around? I'm sure you've seen Ready Player One. Is that a, yeah. a world we're going to be in, where we can just lo like log into this world and, and walk around and be ourselves? I think we might. So I think one of the things that might actually keep VR alive would be if it becomes a social thing. Because that's what Ready Player One shows. It's social VR. You actually perceive each other in VR, you interact with each other in VR. And the obvious thing, and what we're already doing in, in games or in online platforms where you create a profile, is we adapt to what we look like. We adapt what others perceive of us. So I think that might be a direction that, that we might be going into. An interesting design challenge is in, in this area, I think we'll be having eye contact. Yes. I mean, if we're doing FaceTime or, or other sort of, sort of video conferencing, yes. very often we, we look at the camera but not at the person. And that yeah. is something that we need to overcome if we want to yeah. really sort of relate, I think. But I think even that, you wouldn't notice if I'm looking at the top of your head or at your eyes. So I think even that is easy to overcome, given that we give people eyes in VR. If you have a virtual avatar without eyes, there's nothing I can perceive about you. But if we use eye tracking to actually orient your eyes somewhere, I think this is doable. Tell me what, what an avatar without eyes would be. It's scary. <laughs> what would that be? <laughs> Some blind monster, maybe? Something like that. No, it's, yeah. it's really, the design of avatars is, I think, uh, also a very complicated thing. And we'd have to put a lot of thought into, and a lot of research into how, how we perceive each other, how we perceive avatars. And uh, so far, I think the less features you put in and the less realistic you make something, the better. Because our imagination will fill in the rest. And if you make it realistic, we'll just, we'll just be in the uncanny valley and it will just seem like a horror movie. Probably. Scary simulation. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. Sure. Thanks.